Hello YouTube Vintage Stereo Collectors. You're looking at uh, early 70s amplifier here. It's a Kenwood KA2500 made 1970-71. It's an all solid state amp and all silicon transistor amp. So uh, the, net, the previous generation transistor amps had been germanium, some are germanium, silicon depending on the transistors. Um, I like these. They're, uh, they were well built, they were reasonably priced, even though things were expensive. And what I find so amusing about this stuff is I used to service these when they were only a few years old and the problems did come up. Um, I was a service guy back in the 80s so these would have been about a decade old and they were coming in with problems, no easy controls blown transistors, things like that. Now we're at the point where they're over 40 years old. And this one here, I bought it because it was in nice cosmetic condition, not a lot of scratches on it, didn't smell like an ashtray. And uh, it, I was told it was working, and it's true, I put a CD player input on it and I got audio on both channels, didn't sound great. That's kind of what I wanted to talk about today, uh, about, you know, making things just sound a little bit better. And I've already done some work on this one. These are the major filter capacitors in the unit. Now this is one of these interesting things. The filters, especially these ones here, there's a trace of oil seepage on the bottom of every single one. And uh, yet they were still doing their job, but there was definitely a hum, especially if you had headphones on volume would be down, you turn it on, there was a low hum which is, it shouldn't be there. Now this is where it gets interesting. My next step, well I'll replace the filter capacitors. I'm just going to turn it around here so you can see it. Give me a second. Okay, the cans were mounted on the board, okay, and these are hard to match. You can sometimes match them and kind of shimmy them into these um, clips. But what I do is I put a terminal board here using existing screw holes. And so I managed to take care of um, the, 20, the 2200, the 1000, and there was another 1000 under the, bo under the metal board here. I took care of them there. The dropping resistors were always out of spec on these. They're carbon resistors, so I put in metal oxide, which gets the voltages where they are and stable. So I put new filters in this, and here were the two coupling capacitors. This had a thousand microfarad electrolytic in each channel to buffer the speaker outputs from DC voltage, any type of imbalance. So I put these in, turned it on, it wasn't humming as a bad, but it was still there. Okay, that's interesting. We have fresh caps. Now, do I have a bad cap? No, I've never had a problem with these new MIIC ones. So, it's something in the grounding. And so, I don't have... This is what I use for troubleshooting most of the time. This is a $15 Mastercraft digital multimeter. I like it because it's light. I can have it leaning up against the unit, I can check voltages, it's reasonably accurate. I don't have a tone generator, I don't have an oscilloscope on my bench. And being in the trade for over 40 years, honest to God, hardly ever use that stuff. Same with things like Variax. You know, you can have, I've seen shops where it's wall-to-wall -wall test equipment. And they're testing each operation, we're looking for a certain waveform. But this is how it works for me. If it sounds good, it is good. I always went by sound. Clean sound, not distorted, no hum. The unit's not getting too hot. You're on the right track. That may sound overly simplistic, but I have test equipment in the bottom of my cabinet here. It rarely comes out only for something that really is tough to diagnose. Anyway, what the problem was here is I've found this in other units. The case, that's bolted to this, it's bolted to this, heat sink's bolted to that, this metal tray is bolted to the other one. And what happens is there's oxidation between the panels 
and even the screws. This is what cured the hum. This is a ground lug here. One black ground wire to the ground lug on this part, and then another black one and soldered to the backboard, and then the control share a, bu um, a bus wire, tied them all to the same point and soldered. Turn it on, absolutely no ground or any no hum from the uh, ground problem. Sounds absolutely quiet. But then I noticed heat sinks getting really hot on this side. And this is another common problem. I've run into this with Marantz's and Pioneers and Kenwins and Yamahas of this era. The DC bias and the output transistors gets out of whack. And sometimes it's because somebody's gone and played with it. But most of the times, okay, here you have pots, contr control potentiometers. This is the ch what's called the um, channel centering. So there's 0 volts, 24 volts, and 48 volts. Okay, Those are the voltage points in the SAM. And you can adjust the center voltage. And you see, these aren't, it's a push-pull configuration, but it's two NPN transistors. And it's a, it's a strange series configuration. And the drivers are actually an NPN and PNP. And at the time, they were kind of in transition in the industry. So we didn't get into, we had bipolar transistors, but we didn't have complementary pairs. So you ended up with this biasing stuff. And the little controls, and just from oxidation, whatever, but what I think one of the problems was, especially the bias controls, a 500 ohm pot, and there's some current going through it. And it actually, wherever it was set, it ends up burning the trace on the potentiometer. So you get a potentiometer that drifts off with heat. You can't quite get it adjusted right. So I replace them and I actually go up to these ones, okay? These are quarter watt potentiometers and I got a whole bag of them from a surplus company of different sizes and they're center lab and uh, what's neat about these, you solder them in position, you set the bias, set the center voltage and I've looked at the same amp but a year later hardly changed. They're really stable. And you'll know when you get it right. I mean there's different ways to um, um, look at it, like you can download schematics, and this one here actually for Kenwoods, they're almost all the same in that era. It shows you where to put your meter and to you know get the voltages right, the bias current, and it shows different models, how many milliamps, and there's a formula. Uh, but it's basically the same deal for most of them of this configuration, and. This one here, it should be 15 millivolts or 30 milliamps across. There's loading resistors. I'm just going to spin around again. It's kind of a heavy unit. Once it doesn't want to move easily, but uh, come on around. That power transform really loads this one down. These resistors in here, and they're in series with the outputs. I'm going to try to get it over a little bit. We've had such humid weather lately, even with the air conditioning on, everything seems kind of humid in the house. And uh, right here, these wire round 0.5 ohm resistors, and you'll see that configuration. I've seen it on realistic receivers from the same time. Sansui's are exactly the same. And basically you'll have ground at one end, then a resistor, transistor, resistor and B plus and then the same thing and so all you really have to do is go across any resistor and get the, the reading because it's just it's going to be a voltage drop which translates into a current drop. But you can see I've changed some of the caps down here. There were some oil caps um, anything any of those Elna caps that are leaking oil you might think they work okay now but as soon as you start pushing the amp and listening to some rock on it, you're going to blow something. Anyway, I just thought I'd tell you, um, you know, just some hints on uh, refurbishing these amps and enjoying them. Thanks for watching and listening.